When you finished your fMRI analysis, you may wonder how you should report the results. Within the field of cognitive neuroscience, it's common to report the t-statistic for every effect and also to display the results as a t-statistic map overlaid on a template brain. In the results table, it's also common to report either the t-statistic or its equivalent z-score for each cluster. While this may seem reasonable, it can also obscure the full picture and give a distorted view of the practical significance of the result. For example, suppose that a pharmaceutical company advertises a drug that lowers cholesterol. If that was all the information we had, we might assume that the drug is effective and worth paying for. However, if we later find out that the drug leads to a reduction in cholesterol of just 0.01%, we may reconsider whether the drug is worth taking, and indeed, whether the drug in fact works at all. We should ask ourselves the same questions about the effects we observe in the neuroimaging literature, as was raised in a paper by Gung Chen and colleagues in 2017. Usually, the t-statistic allows us to determine whether an effect exists or whether what we're seeing is just due to noise. However, we should also remember that the commonly used threshold of p equals 0.05 is arbitrary, and that small variations around this threshold can lead to one effect being judged significant, and therefore real, while the other is dismissed as non-significant, and therefore that it does not exist. In other words, just reporting the statistic tells you nothing about the magnitude of an effect and can lead to potentially interesting effects being hidden, as we saw in the previous video on highlighting. Instead, reporting both the statistic and the effect size together gives the reader a sense of the effect's reliability and its magnitude. Since the t-statistic is a mixture of both magnitude and variability, it is important to unpack the magnitude aspect of it in order to evaluate both its practical significance and whether it might be an artifact. In an example from the Chen paper, imagine that a t-statistic of 3.35 is reported with 22 degrees of freedom, roughly corresponding to a p-value of 0.001. This might seem like a reasonable t-statistic, and it is. However, if the magnitude of the bold effect is around 10%, this is clearly different from what most experiments would expect and is either an unbelievably large effect or an artifact. What's more, t-statistics can be inflated simply by having a larger sample size. Given equal variance, the same effect size will fall in a narrower portion of the tail of the t-distribution as the degrees of freedom increases, which puts lower-end studies at a disadvantage, whether because they have less money or maybe difficulty accessing a large population of subjects. Finding that two studies have the same effect size, even if one or both of them do not pass significance, is still important evidence for the consistency of an effect across studies, and therefore, for reproducibility. This could also mitigate the so-called significance filter, in which only significant results are reported, which leads to a skewed perception of the distribution of effects in a given field of research. With this in mind, the authors recommend reporting both the t-statistic and its accompanying effect size and within a cluster, reporting the peak of the effect size instead of the t-statistic. And finally, report the full set of parameters used in the study, including the threshold value, degrees of freedom, and any relevant scanner details that may lead to variations in the overall strength of the effects. Let's take a look at how to do this in a software package like AFNI. So we have a template brain, we've overlaid some kind of result, and if you analyze this in AFNI, it's actually quite easy because the default is to show the magnitude as the overlay and use the t-stat as the threshold, which you can set to some significance level like 0.001. Select whatever kind of color scheme you want to make these highlighted to your liking. And you can also choose if you want to do some resampling 
just to make the figure look a little bit more attractive. If we wanted to do the same thing with results from, say, SPM, in the same folder I have results analyzed in that software package. I have the t-statistic map along with the beta and a contrast value. In this case, I'm going to combine the t-statistic and the contrast by using AFNI's 3D tcat command. But you can use whatever kind of calculator that you like. Once they're together, I overlay this new file on top of the template brain called cont combined. And then I'll have a similar pattern. Again, it's not identical. It's analyzed in a different software package. But I can do the same thing of setting the overlay to be the magnitude and the threshold to be the t-statistic. I'll have to find out on my own, given my degrees of freedom, what t-statistic with this slider corresponds to a given significance level, such as 0.001. After that, it's the same thing of trying to find a good color scheme to make the distinction between different magnitudes look as reasonable as possible. I hope this gives you some food for thought about how to present your results, as well as how to interpret results you come across in a presentation or in a journal article that you read. It's a small change that potentially could make your results more reproducible, as well as avoid some of these selective reporting issues that have come up in the literature. So take a look at the paper in the link down below. And also, if you haven't already, maybe watch the video on highlighting to give you a broader set of options for reporting effects. And then make an educated decision about how you want to present your own results.